Professor Serena Slekish, um, we'll now change that uh, geographical focus to Ireland and our final speaker for this session is Assistant Professor Ed Burke from the University of Nottingham. He's going to speak to us on the Irish sovereignty, cyber security and counterintelligence in the 21st century. So thank you, Professor Edward Burke. Thanks. Uh, thank you very much and thanks for the invitation today. Um, it's uh, nine years ago I was uh, seconded by this department as a civilian uh, to a CSDP mission in Afghanistan, the EU uh, police mission. And uh, I had the uh, great pleasure there. Obviously, it was a very Nordic-led mission at the time. And in terms of small states asserting themselves, I can tell you that when you watch a Finnish general have a serious meeting with a four-star American general in a sauna, um, there are certain advantages that the Finns have in terms of getting their way. However, um, in terms of cultural differences, their Irish members of the mission can suffer a little bit in terms of note-taking and concentration. Um, but I want, to, I want to start with a historical anecdote and um, a slightly provocative one since I'm the last speaker before coffee. Uh, so in, in September 1974, um, not far from here, there was a, a rather awkward exchange between the head of the Anglo-Irish uh, section of the Department of Foreign Affairs and the head of Chancery at the British Embassy. And the British had been caught and um, essentially they'd, they'd, they'd shifted the course of HMS Ark Royal, an aircraft carrier, and they basically sent reconnaissance aircraft over uh, Irish airspace to try and seek out um, IRA, Irish Republican Army, arms dumps um, in the Irish state. And of course Dublin Airport detected that, right? So that created an awkward moment. Now the British had even more awkward news. They wanted to do it again because they believed it had been quite successful. Now, this created, obviously, uh, serious concerns within the Department of Foreign Affairs in terms of sovereignty. Um, on, on the one hand, you know, when it comes to the, the classic way of sort of looking at threat, threats, they had, detection had worked, right? detection. But in terms of deterrence and punishment, the options for Ireland at that point weren't great. I mean, there was essentially, they were looking at, well, the Irish Air Corps had, didn't have the aircraft to intercept uh, 30,000 feet over, over, the, uh, over Irish airspace. Um, it was an embarrassing diplomatic incident for, for two uh, allies, really, uh, the United Kingdom and Ireland, in terms of sort of cooperating on counterterrorism um, within the island of Ireland. Um, and so they looked at you know, various options, uh, looking at kind of in terms of punishment, and obviously the EU wasn't an institution you could appeal to, even clandestine, you know, sort of covertly or otherwise, to try and intervene. Ireland wasn't a member of NATO. So they ultimately decided that, that simply a, a, a rather secret um, diplomatic protest was kind of the best way to do things. And then Charles Whelan uh, in this building said to the head of the Chancery, he said, look, if you're going to do it again, we can't stop it, quote unquote, right? So the British did do it. And actually, inadvertently, it, it proved quite useful in terms of intelligence for Ireland as well that were gathered by this, really was, an un, was a clandestine, initially at least, a clandestine violation of of Irish airspace, and that was done by an ally. So that goes to the heart of kind of small states dilemma, right, when it comes to dealing with even very friendly larger states, is that to what extent um, do we have the capacity to deter and even punish when sometimes even, 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 not, even friends or states that are in between sort of do things that we're not too pleased with when it comes to our, our sovereignty. And, and I suppose that's, I really want us to go back to the theme of focus in on these themes of deterrence, detection, and punishment. Um, today, these three elements are, of course, very back, very much back in, in sort of as a pressing priority, including for Ireland. Um, sovereignty in the digital era is, is obviously much, much harder to measure than it was in the 1970s. Um, and so in terms of detection was easier, obviously, in the Irish case in 1974, radar, right? So even today, in terms of sort of occasional Russian um, it, it, it are violations of Irish airspace, for example, you know, that can be t detected reasonably easily. But other things, such as cyber now, is much more difficult to, to find exactly who the author of a violation of, of, of Irish cyber security um, is, or are, are those of our partners in the NB8, is extremely, it can be very, very difficult. Deniability is much more easier when it comes to cyber violations, including even, you know, from um, individuals or um, institutions that are based in Russia, for example. Um, so, of course, uh, so whereas intelligence um, activities in the Cold War could be more readily comprehended, if not always detected, um, and, and did have some discernible patterns, today, obviously, as some of the previous speakers, um, and indeed um, uh, the Permanent Secretary from Iceland also uh, referred to in his intervention, 
Um, it, is, it is much more difficult sometimes to I identify the fingerprints on certain actions when it comes to cyberspace. Um, and, and we've seen, really, in Ireland has seen a proliferation of threats to its security on three uncon unconventional fronts over the last 10 years. First, there has been a significant escalation of the threat from international jihadist terrorism, including from uh, returning fighters from the wars in Libya and Syria. And of course, friends from Finland and Sweden can attest very sadly and tragically that neutrality doesn't exempt you from these type of threats. Um, these attacks do happen and have happened in those countries. And indeed, Ireland, uh, Ankara Shikona and others here um, are having to work very, very hard to ensure um, that such a situation uh, you know, will not or hope, hopefully will not arise um, within the Irish states. Um, and we're seeing extra resources from the Commissioner being put towards that. And of course, um, there have always been, there have been a number of cases of Irish nationals travelling to associate with Islamic State in Syria um, uh, as well. So we're very lucky here to have a long-standing Irish Libyan population, and only a very tiny proportion um, of Libyan nationals, uh, or Libyan Irish nationals, um, will have travelled to Libya, for example, um, to associate with Islamic State. But it is, an, a, a, it is very much a prominent concern, of course, and for those charged with our security, and that has proliferated. And it's something which we're having to work very closely with our, our allies in Europe, particularly in the EU, but also in terms of NATO countries as well, um, to, and within NATO itself, to try and, to try and deal with that. Um, and I would say that when it comes to looking at this, this escalating threat, there is a lot that we can discuss and engage with uh, when, with our uh, NB8 um, allies, with, with our Nordic uh, partners, who have, of course, also grappled with the dilemma of dealing with, um, you know, communities that add a huge amount to the country, but um, also um, within those communities there is, a, there is this very small number of people um, who may be planning um, extreme activities. And how to do that is, is, is very, very difficult. There's no easy way of doing that. And of course, one of the key lessons that we learned from countries such as Denmark, and wonderful work by Danish academics on radicalization, for example, is that, of course, it is very important not to try and sort of fit, describe a community as, as being a sort of single diaspora to understand that there is, therefore there is no self-appointed or even state-appointed leader of that community. And actually doing that type of activity, saying that this voice represents the, the Muslim community in Ireland, um, that can be counterproductive. And so we need to understand the diversity that lies within um, sort of, uh, the, the, uh, the Muslim communities that, communities that exist within our state. Um, and when it comes to counter-radicalization and counter-terrorism, of course, the EU, uh, JHA, um, not least the Siena system, remains, will be absolutely vital in the future uh, for Ireland's counter-terrorism um, efforts. However, uh, similarly, and here's the, the Brexit conundrum, obviously we share a common travel area. We're not in Schengen, we share a common travel area with the United Kingdom. And uh, Five Eyes will uh, obviously remain indispensable to Irish security in the future. Um, and in terms of trying to, uh, you know, Ireland is having to, you know, will have to look at ways to keep the CTA, the common travel area, secure after Brexit. That's quite complex. That's quite difficult if the UK pulls out of various data sharing mechanisms, various JHA mechanisms. And um, what do we do at the bilateral level will be a very interesting, um, difficult question. And their models of Nordic security cooperation can help. I mean, hopefully the UK will go the way of Iceland and Norway and link up to uh, EU JHA in a very constructive um, way. But, but that's, that certainly cannot be taken for granted. Just moving on to, to cyber, the second threat then. Well, if you look at in terms of contagion, in terms of attacks, Ireland has suffered major cybersecurity attacks um, in recent years. And indeed, Kieran Martin, a Northern Irishman who is also the head of the UK National Cyber Cybersecurity Centre, has said that you know, a, crit a, a Category 1 uh, attack on uh, the UK is, is, is highly probable in the next few years. And the risk of contagion then to Ireland is clearly evident. We're very linked up with the UK. It's very difficult to sort of detach yourselves in cyberspace. Um, and we've already seen with ESB as well, attacks on ESB, how, how potentially damaging that can be. So, so, so what can we do about this? Well, uh, the Nordic Council cyber initi initiatives and, and wider NB8 uh, cyber cooperation um, is quite instructive. It's quite very useful. I would urge um, the government uh, to also in Ireland to look at cybersecurity university partnerships with Nordic states that already do wonderful work in cybersecurity. In Ireland, we have some of the best minds um, in the world when it comes to cybersecurity. We need to tap into that as a state uh, to an unprecedented degree if we are to sort of 
um, I would say, deter, detect, and even look at collectively trying to punish those who would violate our cybersecurity. Our global importance as a centre of industry really depends on that. Um, and I would also say that in terms of, you know, there's a lot of good things being done in terms of the, uh, Ireland's National Cybersecurity Centre, uh, the National Security Analysis Centre in the Department of the Taoiseach. This is, this is a government that's taking these issues seriously. Um, but the resources are still not quite there. And so as we build up our infrastructure, um, we need to, uh, we can look at other uh, European states who've also gone through this experience, not least in terms of looking at NATO-led initiatives and EU-led initiatives in Estonia, for example. Um, and I would say that, that the EU and NATO uh, can only go so far. Obviously, there are some things within the EU and NATO that are very, very sensitive and that will not be shared by the UK, France or others. And we need to understand ourselves as well that even with our closest allies, we also need to be able to, um, you know, some things do need to remain secure, even from our, our dearest friends, right? That their, Ireland has interests that are different, even sometimes from our closest allies. And so having our own capacity, like, you know, in fact, this is an argument very much made in Norway as well, for example, that, that's really important too. We shouldn't underestimate the need to, to do that. Um, it's, it's, so we move from airspace to cyberspace. Um, the two need to be protected. Um, and how we do that. And if you looked at what the NBAs were looking at in terms of Icelandic airspace, for example, um, but also cyberspace, um, really working as small countries in Europe uh, to try and maximize uh, lessons, opportunities, um, and even uh, working collectively. I mean, the, the Northern Group of Defense Ministers that is um, operated by the, the Nordic Council and often includes NBAs as well, is an interesting dimension of this. The UK has joined the Northern Group of Defense Ministers. I think we need as many sort of post-Brexit, we need to be in the room with the UK as much as possible in various regional organizations, not least to protect our, our, very, our very valuable common travel area. Um, and so I think moving to, to engage the, the Nordic Council and, and, and wider MBA initiatives on that is, is, is a very, very, is very worthy um, and highly, re highly recommendable thing to do. Um, so I, 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 better, I better stop now. Um, but I'll just to sum up and say that you know, we have huge amounts of capacity here in terms of our digital economy. Clearly, Ireland is the center of the world. Um, if you look at travel to Silicon Valley, if you look at the people who are working leading on cybersecurity, many of them are Irish nationals. We have a lot to offer in terms of our universities. And the state is building up its institutions to deal with cybersecurity. Um, so on, on all these areas, in counter-terrorism, counter-radicalization, uh, in terms of cyber, um, and even the old traditional stuff, such as looking at the increase in foreign, foreign major increase in foreign, foreign intelligence activity in this state, we need to work very closely with our Nordic partners who have experience, a lot of experience in dealing with all these things, including the traditional espionage activities, um, and trying to um, move to sort of, to, to basically uh, make sure that small, smaller states such as Ireland, that in the 21st digital century, um, that we are very much um, able to exert our own interests, um, protect our own sovereignty, um, and work closely and add, uh, which I think we can, immense value to our European partners. Thank you very much.